so if we think about the role of psilocybin in nature, and you were talking about it acting on insects, um, do you think, does that preclude it from having a kind of dual function on trying to kind of um, exert some, uh, you know, maybe it evolved uh, to have some effect on mammals like us, you know, the fact that it does yes, raise so kind of ecological awareness, it may be serving some function in that sense. I, yes, exactly. I, I think it, I think that's exactly it. Uh, you know, I mean, psilocybin is, is there in nature and it's doing its thing with, uh, you know, different insect populations that it interacts with. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's all good. And then over the course of tens of millions of years, mammals with complex nervous systems emerge and, uh, it just happens to be very adaptive to that. It happens to, uh, uh, you know, occupy the right receptors that elicits these incredible states of mind. Uh, I just did a talk. Uh, uh, we just did a, a virtual conference that was hosted by the uh, Mount Tamalpais uh, Psychedelic Society, I believe. It was called the Psilocybin uh, Summit. Right. And, uh, and I gave a talk which was called uh, Psilocybin and Its Place in Nature. And uh, it was highly speculative. But uh, one of the things I talked about is, you know, in, in terms of fungal interactions with, uh, with insects, you know, the most extreme, most interesting ones in some ways are the cordyceps fungi, which you may mm. know about. They're ascomycetes and they're so-called entomophagous fungi. They eat insects or they infect insects, but they do so in very interesting ways because they infect them. They don't kill them immediately, but they kind of turn them into zombies. And, and they direct their behavior so that uh, the insect that's infected is, is, is compelled to travel to a place like the top of a stalk of grass or something to optimize its spore dispersal. And then the fungus kills it and it, it, it induces this death grip on the, on the stem and then it grows through the, through the uh, the uh, exoskeleton of the uh, of, of the insect and sporulates. The spores shower down on the ants below, and they get infected. So it's a wonderful dispor uh, dispersal mechanism for the spores for the mushroom. There's also this strange uh, relationship between cicadas and uh, a mushroom called, or it's not a mushroom actually, but a, a fungus called Massospora. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. That, uh, so the cicadas are insects that have a very long life cycle and they spend like 17 years underground, essentially in hibernation. And then they all come out in a swarm, you know, and if you live on the East Coast, if you've ever been there for one of these cicada swarms, it's pretty, it's surreal, man. I mean, it's like Hellstrom's Chronicles. These cicadas literally are everywhere. They coat the streets there. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's very peculiar. Well, it turns out there's a fungus that infects some of these, some of these cicadas underground, the, the, the genus is Massospora. And it's not closely related to, to uh, the psilocybe mushrooms, but it does make psilocybin. And uh, it makes another compound, cathedone, which happens to be an amphetamine-like compound that's found in cot, the, uh, the stimulant, you know, uh, cathedulous. So you got this alkaloid from a higher plant or known from a higher plant. You've got psilocybin. And these fungi invade the, the cicadas. And they, uh, uh, when the cicadas come out, uh, what happens is they replace their genitalia with these spore masses so that the cicadas emerge from the ground immediately their butts fall off <laughs> but they're hyper stimulated because of the because of the psilocybin and and the uh, cathodote so they will try to mate with anything in sight 
the net effect of this is it's wagging its tail around and mm -hmm. spreading these spores all over the place. So that's a fairly <laughs> grisly thing to think about. But what I, where I'm going with this is I think that this may be what the, so we know there are examples of in nature where fungi will modulate behavior, right? Like with the cicadas, like with the, the cordyceps, or, or I think they're now called ophiocordyceps. Anyway, the name has changed. But we see this where fungi actively inter intervene or symbiose with, with uh, these organisms and direct their behavior. Maybe this is actually what's going on with us and psilocybin. It's a kind of an eco-neural hormone. It doesn't have to invade our brains, thank God, you know, because it just offers this, this hormone to us, which is attractive to us, which we enjoy consuming. And, uh, you know, the fungus, it fulfills its agenda because then we cultivate the fungus, spread the spores around, form a symbiosis and it's a it's a mutually right. beneficial symbiosis and even beyond that you know now uh, you know another interesting thing that's going on in the area of psilocybin research is because there's so much commercial interest several a couple of uh, groups of researchers have succeeded in uh, putting the genes into uh, e coli mm -hmm. and uh, another group is working on yeast and they've got these strains of E. coli that express psilocybin or these strains of yeast that express psilocybin. So again, maybe, you know, mushroom would unlikely be able to, uh, you know, spread to those kinds of things on its own, even with horizontal gene transfer, but with a little help from us, it gets its genes into organisms that would never show up there. And the potential, you know, I mean, that, that's a two-edged sword. That's one of these typical technologies that's, you know, I mean, I'm not sure we want strains of E. coli that express psilocybin, but the potential yeah. for bioterrorism is, you know, who knows, you know, I'm not yeah. sure I want those in the water system of major metropolitan cities. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, beer brewed from from yeast that can express the genes, they, that might be kind of interesting. So anyway, yeah. I think that's what's going on. I think they're really, they're really, you know, eco-neural hormones in a certain sense, you know, right. that form these relationships with primates and, uh, and fulfill their, their, their purposes, their agenda, yeah. you know, which is, which is a pretty simple agenda, like all, mushrooms like all fungi basically grow and spread yeah you know, that's, and that's really all all they want to do <laughs> i feel like with fungi in general they're um you know they they tend to play this role of tying ecosystems together right like you see the where they shuttle around nutrients to different trees and they you know other forms of life can't exist without them performing this role so it seems very plausible to me yeah as you say that evolutionarily they would stumble on chemicals that approximate orally active forms of DMT, you know, you, if you think of DMT as the kind of prototypical endogenous mammalian psychedelic, um, and for whatever reason, you know, its effect on neural circuitry is to take us away from this uh, feeling of being a separate ego that wants to dominate nature and lives from a pace of fear. And actually, if you activate it, it takes us back into a perspective of wanting to kind of collaborate and symbiose, as you say, with nature. Um, it seems very plausible to me that that's why we, yeah, psilocybin has the effect it does because, you know, we're not the only intelligent species, you know, plant intelligence is a thing, fungal intelligence is a thing that comes out of the life process and nature. And that you and I exactly. having this conversation now, spreading the word about this, I, you know, I'm open to the idea that we've effectively been brainwashed by, by the mushroom, but, um, but it's a benevolent message. And it's a message that checks out when you compare it with science. It's not a, it's not, yeah, it's, so yeah. I think it's perhaps they're wiser than we are. <laughs> It, it's not it's not anti-scientific at all you know yeah. and I, I would i would say you could say well we've been brainwashed by the fungus but you could say also we've been educated by the fungus yeah. you know and that's that's another way to look at it because one of the things among many things about the psilocybin experience that's interesting you know you've got 
it opens up this whole interior landscape, these other dimensions and these entities, whether they're real or, or not, it opens up that. But also when you turn your attention to the outside and you look at nature from a state of psilocybin ecstasy, you notice things about nature that are always there, but we're programmed not to notice. You know, so you can look at natural processes. I don't know if you know the work of Simon Powell. He writes very interesting work, wrote uh, The Psilocybin Solution, and uh, I think his latest book is called The Magic Mushroom Explorer. He talks about how uh, uh, you can think of the psilocybin really as a, as a scientific instrument. You know, it's a, it's a lens through which you can examine nature. And because the nature of the psychedelics is to bring the background forward, it, 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 you know, it demolishes this default mode network that we construct around ourselves. The default mode network is programmed to suppress a lot of, a lot of information coming in. We've got, you know, these, neur- I think the term is neural gating mechanisms which shut stuff out, you know, because they're irrelevant to our immediate survival needs. And one of the values of psychedelics, it, it temporarily disables all that. So you open up to the, this, this uh, information flood from outside the self. You notice things about nature that, you know, they're always there, but you're, you know, you, you're just programmed not to notice them or not consider them important. And then you can have one of these experiences and and notice this stuff. And then when you go back and look at the same phenomenon, when you're not stoned, you know, you can validate it in a sense. You can say, yeah, this is really happening. I just never noticed it before. So I think, I think, as you say, I think that these things are, uh, you know, they're, they're lenses through which we can learn about nature. And I think that's a big difference between, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, uh, in, as Westerners, as literate people and so on, we tend to have a very, very strong uh, default mode network, you know, and, and a lot of it, um, I mean, it has to do, I think, with literacy and this separation are that, you know, you can't be literate without a point of view. Right, you've got to have. If you're going to read a book, the book is here, and you're here, and you're having that in that relationship. I think that indigenous people, especially if they're pre-literate, I think their day to day state of consciousness is much closer. They have much less uh, developed, if you want to use that word, default mode networks. So they're open to more stuff. You know, they're mo- open right. to more input.